as people are filtering into the meeting, um, we'll do a little bit of introductions before we um, jump into the meat of the prep tech talk. Um, one basic logistical item is uh, due to the large attendance, all the participants will be muted during the duration of the prep tech talk. Um, but we have disabled the Q&A function for this particular session um, because of some um, intricacies of teams. But if you do have questions and we encourage you to ask questions, um, please use the chat function. We will do our best to make sure that any questions that are, are coming up are answered either via chat or um, directly by the speakers. Um, and if anything is not able to be answered during the session, um, we'll make sure that we get written answers um, for folks um, afterwards and that'll be included in the materials, um, which leads me to the resources. All registrants will be emailed a recording um, of this event. Um, we'll also post them on our NAPSIG resources tab and we'll share links um, on Twitter, Facebook. LinkedIn and, and um, whatnot. I guess we should eventually call that X, but um, took me long enough to remember Twitter. Um, just to go over our agenda, I'm going to give you a re real brief introduction if those of you who do, don't know who NAPSIG Foundation is, and then we'll jump into the meat of the presentation and then I'll bring us home. Um, so quick introduction for those of you who don't, don't know us. Um, NAPSIG Foundation is a 501c3. We were established in 2005. And I just want to say how excited I am on this particular topic because the reason, one of the main reasons NAPSIG Foundation was created um, was because of we we're trying to find ways to help address some of the um, uh, inefficiencies we saw in the National Fire Incident Reporting System. And we've now come full circle and this is, we're hosting a, um, a prep tech talk on the solution for this. And so I'm super excited. Um, and I'm also excited that Rebecca Harnett is participating in this. Rebecca is my partner in crime in helping to start NAPSIG Foundation, and, and now she's leading the charge on the nearest effort. So this is just exciting as can be for me. Um, for those of you, again, who don't know our mission, we kind of have a three-part mission. We're really focused on a technical advancing geospatial skills and capabilities, but we're equally focused on making sure those geospatial skills and capabilities are adopted by users. Um, and then to make sure that happens, we really heavily focus on bridging the gaps between the technical, technical and the operational. Um, cross disciplines, all levels of government, all disciplines, and in, even internationally. That being said, um, I'm excited to move us to the actual presentation, and I'll kick it over to the team to uh, introduce themselves and cover the agenda. Great. Well, thank you so much, Peter, and thanks everyone for joining us. So <clears throat> our goal for today is to really work with all of you so that you can gain a basic understanding of the new National Emergency Response Information System, NEARIS, which is currently in development and will be launching later in 2024. So today we hope to cover four primary objectives. One of those is learning about the core features and functionality that will be available in NEARIS gain insights about how you'll use the system and apply nearest data to different analytics and GIS-based risk assessments, risk reduction efforts, mitigation strategies, and planning efforts. And then work with all of you to get some insights on developing your de fire department's plan for onboarding your department or organization onto nearest and ways to implement nearest capabilities across your organizations. And then obviously you get an opportunity here to engage directly with the nearest uh, team and contribute ideas on enhancing the platform. As Peter mentioned, I think all uh, question and answer and dialogue will be taken in through the chat and we have a few minutes at the end to answer some key questions. So just a quick uh, summary on, on speakers. I'll introduce myself and then go around uh, the, the, the webinar here. So Rebecca Harnett, I'm an advisor to the U.S. Fire Administration, specifically focused on data and technology modernization and the development of the new NEARIS. And over to Tom. Yes, I'm Tom Jenkins. I'm a retired fire chief, and I'm serving as a senior advisor and research manager on the NEARIS project. David. Hi, David Alexander. I'm a senior science advisor at DHS Science and Technology. 
and supporting as a technical advisor to NERIS, as well as a, an expert for uh, science to the U.S. Fire Administration. Great, and over to Craig. I'm Craig Weinshank. I'm a research engineer at FSRI, the Fire Safety Research Institute, and I'm currently the, the principal investigator on the FSRI side for the NERIS project. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started here. So what we're focused on today is this new era of emergency response data and analytics really focused on the new NERIS platform. Uh, next slide. Great. So from a U.S. Fire Administration standpoint, uh, you know, really our mission is to support and strengthen the fire and emergency medical services EMS at the local level to prepare for mitigate, uh, prevent, mitigate and respond to all hazards. And we really do that through four major pillars, which are represented by the four stars in our logo. So the first of those is fire and EMS training. So if any of you have uh, been to the National Fire Academy or have received training uh, in your regions provided through NFA, you'll be familiar with some of what we provide on the training side. Additionally, we have research as one of our major pillars uh, or research and technology. So we have quite a few lanes of effort working uh, really at the cutting edge of some key research areas that are very uh, critical to fire and EMS. And then we have the National Fire Data Center or NFDC which if you are familiar with the legacy NFERS system, NFERS is a program within the National Fire Data Center, and it's also the home to where NERIS uh, will be as well. And then the last star in our pillars here is community risk reduction, uh, which is obviously quite overarching. And you know we incorporate CRR, or community risk reduction, into training, into research, and then certainly on the data side as well. Next slide. And I should mention that 2024 is our 50th anniversary. I know that was on the last slide. So it is a really fortuitous time for us to be launching uh, the new NERIS, given the fact that we were established uh, 50 years ago um, in 2020. I'm sorry, it, now that we're in 2024. And as a part of our founding statute, uh, it our founding statute established 50 years ago the National Fire Data Center. So really the charge of the data center as it's defined in statute hasn't changed. So we have the responsibility to operate a National Fire Data Center for the selection, analysis, collection, publication, dissemination of information uh, pertaining to all hazards that the fire service responds to. And so um, for the last many years, we've been doing that through the legacy Enfer system. Next slide. So the question I have for you, and you, you don't have to necessarily react, but to, is to answer this question of whether or not you agree. A lack of understanding of fire's threat helps to account for the low priority given to fire protection at the local level. So I know in, in past engagements with our stakeholders, they've confirmed and reaffirmed for us many times that we still face this challenge. And, and this challenge really comes out of the America Burning Report from 1973. So 51 years ago is where this exact quote came from. And we still face this challenge today on really at a nationwide basis at the local level. And so as we look at the charge for why are we developing near us, why are we starting to think about how to approach fire data collection, aggregation, analysis differently, it's so that hopefully in the near future, we won't continue to face this very challenge and we can increase the priority given to fire protection in a way that's balanced with empirical understanding of the data around fire's threat on a nationwide basis. Next slide. Great, so to address this challenge uh, last year, uh, 51, oh, well, last year uh, in 2023, at the 50th anniversary of the America Burning Report, uh, USFA entered into an interagency agreement uh, with Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology, and, and David will speak a little bit more to DHSST's role in this effort. But we really saw this as a great opportunity to 
combine forces um, and leverage our respective subject matter expertise to addressing this challenge around fire data and analysis for the nation. So as a part of that effort, um, a, a research and development effort was launched also in partnership with the Fire Safety Research Institute or FSRI as a 501c3 nonprofit uh, neutral science organization. So our three entities have come together to really work to solving this very challenge that we'll be talking about the solutions around today. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to David. All right, thank you, Rebecca. So maybe a few points on DHS S&T, who we are and our role within the uh, Homeland Security Enterprise. You know, DHS serves as a science advisor for the, for the larger Homeland Security Enterprise, as well as the research and development arm uh, for the Homeland Security Enterprise. And that gives us and affords us an opportunity to partner with key operating components, as well as external stakeholders like the first responder community in addressing two really key uh, aspects. First is acknowledging that there's a constantly changing threat and security environment. The evolving fire risk uh, that Rebecca mentioned is an example of that evolving threat and security environment, as well as it, it being exacerbated and influenced by and a rapidly accelerating and emerging technology revolution uh, that will hold tremendous potential for the department, but at the same time may introduce some additional risk for the department. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we're doing in s and is really engaging our key stakeholders, including our operating components to identify areas where we can explore new science and technology frontiers. And in this case, it involves us investing in new technologies around new sensors, uh, platforms. Nearest is an example of a key collaboration where we're trying to leverage new advances in risk analysis, access and fusion of new information as well as the integration of artificial intelligence and, and other predictive modeling capabilities to drive more actionable information to our key stakeholders. And at the same time, recognizing that there are opportunities for us to integrate some other foundational research that we're involved in around new wildfire uh, sensors, new earth observation and detection capabilities, and then collect and analyze information and trends around the changes in the practice and what these threats and new technologies may mean in terms of how we evolve as a community going forward to address uh, key risk and threats uh, within both the larger first responder and emergency management communities, as well as in supporting the explicit needs and requirements of the fire community. Um, so little bit about s and and our contributions and our support uh, in the nearest effort, and I'll turn it over. Thank you so much, David. So what I'd like to share with you is a bit about NERIS, why we're building it out, and also how we are thinking through the different considerations. So as I mentioned, NERIS will eventually be the replacement system to the legacy ENFERS, that's the National Fire Incident Reporting System. So, and I'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that timeline regarding that transition from ENFERS to NERIS as we get towards the end of today's presentation. But really, we need to think about NERIS differently. NERIS is a massive evolution from what ENFERS historically provided and what the mission of ENFERS was. Ultimately, our, our statutory requirements remain the same. But what we're trying to do with NERIS is look at this problem and the solution differently. And really the goal of NERIS is to empower local fire and emergency services by equipping them with near, and again, near real time information and analytic tools that support data informed decision making, right? So historically, ENFERS was more of a data collection and aggregation environment. Um, it didn't necessarily provide back out to the, the fire service, actionable information. And that's how we're looking at NERIS differently. And you'll see more about, about what some of that's gonna look like and what some of the, the drafts in our, in our 
prototype version look like today? Next slide. So the guiding objectives around NERIS is number one. Our goal is for a NERIS to be the premier source for nationwide all hazards incident information. It will eventually replace the 20 plus year legacy and first system. And as a part of this, we're working to improve quality of the data, coverage, timeliness of that local all hazards incident data. And I've even seen some comments in the chat to the same end. And yes, we understand the challenges and how can we do that in a way that uh, makes the data entry process easier. Um, and potentially if the data already exists somewhere, how can we pull that in? Um, and, and yes, we do know uh, NFIRST has been around for over 40 years at, actually at this point, but when we look at its current version, that's more or less 20 years ago. So the other aspect about NERIS in terms of a guiding objective is responsive design. And what we mean by that is that the new NERIS is going to be fully accessible on all types of devices. So that includes mobile devices, tablets, laptops, desktop computers. It will be fully accessible on any computer or mobile device that has any type of internet connection. So device agnostic, internet connection agnostic, even as you know, far as a dial up internet connection. So really that flexibility from a hardware standpoint, as well as from a data pipeline standpoint. Next slide. The approach and core functionality. So NERIS is being built out as a secure cloud hosted architecture. And I know as we talk about this in the year 2024, that sounds standard, but um, the legacy and first system, uh, it was not designed in a cloud environment. So it's, it, that is a major modernization effort that we were making as a part of this. We're also putting interoperability and in data sharing first. And what we mean by that is the ability for NERIS to easily and scalably consume data from other sources, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those, as well as the ability to provide NERIS data out back to the fire service in live API services in multiple formats that are highly interoperable and based on open standards. And so another key driver in terms of functionality is we're designing NERIS in the data collection experience, meaning for the firefighters, because we recognize no, no one signs up for the fire service for the purpose of entering an incident report. So how can we reduce data entry burdens on the fire service? And two of the key ways that we're doing that is through the integration of existing GIS data, uh, the integration of CAD data or computer-aided dispatch data, as well as integration of existing records management data. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that works um, in the next part of the presentation. But if data is already getting collected, how can that help to pre-populate those incident records, right? Um, and can we simplify the data model so that it is less cumbersome and less time consuming from a data entry standpoint? Uh, next slide. So the other part around NERIS that we're looking at is how can we go the next step farther? Um, it's not just about data collected, but it's also about can we provide back to the fire service insights and actionable intelligence, even derived from their own department's data, much less data from their surrounding mutual aid partners and whatnot, to give them information to help them improve some of their own operations. Uh, if you don't, you can't improve what you don't measure, right? So how can we bring this back together? So we're really looking at NERIS and as a part of building out what we call a data management and integration environment. So if for those of you that are technical on the call, that's a data lake house environment where we're really looking at integrating a lot of disparate data um, available across the nation. A lot of it's publicly accessible, some of it's licensed data, things like that. And how can we integrate that information with our local incident data so that we have better intelligence? Um, and that may be intelligence on uh, different vulnerabilities, you know, in a fire department's first due, as well as capability gaps, whether that's training, equipment, it could be staffing, uh, perhaps it's deployment planning, pre-incident planning. So really helping to understand those needs and gaps um, and using data to illuminate that. 
Uh, next slide. Great. And with this, I'd like to hand it over to Tom Jenkins. Over to you, Tom. Perfect transition. And so uh, when we've developed NEARIS, one of the most important things is to look at the beneficiaries of this sort of information, information that with a legacy system is difficult to extract. Local decision makers and fire and emergency response organizations need information about risk. Uh, some of this augmented and provided from good and reliable sources. They need information on performance and deployment, adequate crew size, information to inform training needs and how their staffing is adequate or inadequate for the risk and the environment of response for their particular community. And so this is the kind of information that we strive for and we think about as we have designed near us and as we continue to modify it based on feedback and information that we obtain from the fire service community. Now there's one thing for sure. On the next slide, um, we are more than aware that with 27,000 some odd fire departments across the country, we have to be adaptable to how those fire departments connect into near us. We wanna be able to obtain information in near real time, which requires connectivity and which requires us to be uh, dynamic in the way in which we connect to those departments. One of the ways in which we'll be able to connect to fire departments is at the basic level through an incident data collection app. This app has been developed already, and as I'll talk about momentarily, is already being prototyped within six fire departments so that they can test the information and the logic and the flow of the architecture of the app. That basic app will be available free of charge and allows firefighters to enter it on a mobile phone or an iPad or any sort of mobile device uh, right there from the incident scene or on their way back to quarters if that's what they desire. Then there's going to be other fire departments in that 27,000 that may have a CAD, for instance, that they're able through an API <laughs> connection to connect into nearest, but they may also use this incident data collection app as a, as a hybrid way of, of submitting incident information. That too will be just fine and, and a way for us to, to connect with those departments. And then also increasingly common will be departments that connect in an advanced way. An advanced way meaning that, that we will be able to obtain information from their CAD, the story that is told with what the fire department is called for, and then also connect into a third party RMS, a third party RMS uh, that has nearest compliant data fields, and they'll connect into us via API um, and so departments of all shapes and sizes across the country will have sufficient opportunity to submit and be able to participate in NERIS. Now, one of the distinct characteristics of NERIS is that it's not just about submitting information about incident response. It's also about making sure that a dividend is paid to those firefighters. As was mentioned in one of the comments, uh, there, was a, there was a comment about uh, there needs to be a change in culture. And as a 26 year career firefighter, I agree. And I think one of the ways that we begin to shift that culture and change the way that firefighters and emergency responders look at this sort of information and data collection is we begin to tell them information about risk and performance and, and deployment within their community. And we do that on the next slide through the overall nearest environment. You see, all these de departments connecting into near us, that is one very crucial part, but it's also about making sure that analytics, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, are provided back a menu of information that fire departments can use for the first time ever from a national system to begin to make decisions based on that, that information, based on that data. Now, today, there are certainly departments that use analytics to make decisions, but they do that on while utilizing uh, you know, third party software companies and extensive investment in human resource. And so we wanna make it easier for fire departments, big and small, to be able to have that information at their fingertips. But it's not just that, it's that in the nearest environment, we're able to also have bi-directional exchange, single directional exchange with other people who might need that information and be able to augment it for the betterment of the fire service in general. This could be the National Firefighter Cancer Registry, the National Weather Service, researchers, and of course, very important stakeholders with the state fire marshal's offices. 
All of those various stakeholders need information from their frame of reference and Nearest will be able to provide that and provide it in near real time for the first time. Every fire department within Nearest will have a landing page, as you can see on the next slide. And this is just a sample of one of the prototype departments and what they might see. But in that landing page is core information about the department that is crucial to telling the story about deployment and how well we assemble a, an effective response force and really take care of the risk that is present in a community. The department updates that information at a regular interval and it helps them understand their effective response force, their character of risk in their first due environment, their deployment and other metrics that will certainly evolve as we grow more and more comfortable with near us. The incident information, which is most comparable to the legacy system that we're all familiar with, is also improved, as you can see on the next slide. Departments will be able through their landing page to look at information about specific incidents, uh, category of incidents, and we've worked hard and diligently to improve the workflow, improve the logic, and categorize incidents in a way that just makes sense for firefighters. It was always my experience that firefighters don't avoid doing reports correctly. Normally, the emotion was they grew frustrated with trying to find the right way to enter data. And so we've worked hard to try to make that logical so that firefighters at 3 a.m. can give us good information and help us tell a story about risk and incident response. We're able to extract information about property and, and, and augment data that is submitted in a way that makes it easier for firefighters. We're also collecting different metrics Prior to near us, the only way that you could really measure the significance of an incident might be the time duration of the call or um, information submitted on property loss or counting casualties, civilian and firefighter. Now we're looking at information about whether or not a May Day occurred. Did we evacuate citizens? Did we rescue citizens? And we're able to also look at a much more robust list of actions and tactics that were employed to safely mitigate the call. And that's information that can be extracted later to help fire chiefs know what's going on in their department. We have additional tactical timestamps that CAD uh, will be able to submit into nearest, things like completing a 360, establishing rapid intervention, and a whole host of things that in the real world matter to firefighters. And we're also looking at enhanced response time calculations that we want to provide departments with good information about their response in conjunction with what you would see in industry best practices, accreditation, or NFPA standards. On the next slide are the prototype departments that are currently using the basic version, the incident data collection app for NEARUS to help us inform some uh, continued modifications and improvement to the system. This is the Springdale Fire Department in Arkansas, uh, the Orange County Fire Authority in California, the West Metro Fire Protection District in Colorado, the Upper Marion Township uh, Fire Department in Pennsylvania, Frisco, Texas Fire Department in Fairfax County, Virginia. These organizations have been working diligently to provide us feedback and you can see um, one of the screenshots from the actual app that they're using while they're still submitting to the legacy system to help us compare and contrast and ultimately improve near us as we go forward. Now, there's no doubt that in uh, the crowd today of 158, I see that there are many of you representing uh, fire departments. And so it is certainly uh, our responsibility to let you know that there are some ways that you can prepare for, for near us onboarding. On the next slide, uh, one of the most important steps is to identify an individual that can be a point of contact as we uh, continue to step closer uh, to onboarding um, of version one of near us. Uh, that person needs to not be eligible for retirement and needs to be able uh, to work with us over uh, the period of time of onboarding. It's also important that you reach out and know who your CAD and RMS vendors are and talk to them uh, about near us to make sure that they're aware. Uh, we're also doing that diligently on our end. Because NEARUS is geospatial in operation and set up, uh, your boundaries are imperative to knowing information about your risk and performance. So gathering information about your boundaries and of course, basic demographic information about your department in terms of stations, staffing, specialized resources are the best ways right now for you to prepare to onboard. 
And now with that, I pass it over to my colleague Craig Weinshank to discuss some of the more intricate details of NIRS. Craig. Thanks, Chief. Um, first, um, you know, when we talk about the, the data framework, and there was a question in the chat earlier um, about who owns um, the data. And I think in, in a system like this, data governance is, is critically important to establish from the start and to communicate, communicate clearly. And for us, you know, the department entering the data owns the rights to that data. And what we mean by that is, is FSRI, who's working to, you know, build this, this tool and, and USFA and the state fire marshals, those folks don't have access to change the data. The department that collected the data owns the rights to that data, and only members of that department can change that data. The other piece is how do we share data? So when data is entered into the system, it's appropriate sharing by default. So now when a department in a particular state enters that data, that data is automatically shared to their state fire marshal. So we no longer have to do the manually routing uh, through um, through those, those processes that have historically been in place. Same thing, they would automatically route to the national level. So as data is being uh, entered into the system and whether that's coming through a validation process at the RMS level or a validation process within the NARA system. Once that, that data is validated, it can then move through our system automatically to the, to the appropriate um, uh, organizations in the hierarchy. Uh, the next piece and, and another critical piece about our framework is our semantic layer. Um, one of the challenges that we've always faced in the fire service is, as Chief Jenkins mentioned, but 27,000 fire departments, historically we've had 27,000 ways to do things. Uh, we have slightly different definitions, whether you're on the East Coast versus the West Coast versus the center of the country. And so what we want to do with, with, with all of the values that we have, so any value that's being questioned in, in, in nearest any of our choice lists or our type lists that support those questions, everything will have a definition. And then if there's values within those definitions that still need further exclamation, like our secondary or tertiary values, we'll have definitions there as well. So the big piece is having a, a, a thorough and interactive and a publicly available data dictionary is critical uh, to having and trying to improve some of the data quality issues we, we've always faced when, when people don't necessarily understand um, you know, why they're entering a particular value. Uh, the same thing is how all of these things relate. So how one value relates to the other, where things are multiple across the system. Um, and, and the other piece is, is, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So if there's definitions that exist by consensus across the fire service, we're going to use those first class. Um, we don't want to create narrow specific definitions. Uh, we want to use what, what the industry and what our fire service has already kind of generally accepted. Um, and then every one of our definitions will be referenced, so you'll be able to see our source material of where they're coming. Uh, the last piece, too, is, is a lot of our data schema. You know, there's, there's questions that we want to answer, things like, you know, how do we improve addressing and geolocation? Well, we're going to follow NG911 data models, right? That's that's where the industry is going. That's where where our, our collective geospatial community is driving towards. We're going to support NG911 for all of our addressing and location information. Uh, same thing where with the National Emergency Inf Emergency Medical Service Information System or NEMSIS. If they're collecting that information in NEMSIS, we shouldn't be duplicating in NERIS, right? We can connect to those systems to, to reduce the burden of data collection on our firefighters. If we can reduce that burden, right, we can we can give back time to that firefighter who's who's uh, responding to a numerous calls in their shift or coming back from a fire at two or three o'clock in the morning. Uh, the same thing as we look to connect to our, our wildland uh, components in Irwin and Inform. How can we make those connections so that we can, one, pass information between the two systems to get a better understanding of our resources, resource allocation, and the demand on units, but also be able to make sure we're capturing all of these incidents. Um, other things like ATF's bomb arson and tracking system or BATS, um, that's a big piece for understanding the fire investigation and the criminal side of that. How can we connect with them to minimize some of those burdens if you're entering into BATS? Uh, and then the last piece is is FEMA Go. So for folks who are working to um, who have ever had to fill out a, a FEMA Go um, you know, application for part of their grant application, uh, we're going to be working to connect with them to alleviate a lot of the manual entry. If you can enter your NERIS ID into the system, we can connect and pass a lot of that information first class to minimize some of the burden uh, for the fire service. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about the schemas and where we are. At the core of our, our system is kind of our entity or organization specification. So this is what's going to define all of the, the entities in our system. Um, you know, if we think for the 
at, at the core is going to be all the fire departments. And this is our, our profile, as Tom kind of alluded to, is, is geospatial in nature. So it's understanding the geopolitical boundaries of, of a particular response area, all the stations and staffing relationships, all the relationships between mutual and automatic aid, then also the relationships between, uh, for example, in the DC COG, uh, we have county departments that also have volunteers inside of them. So understanding the relationships between these departments so that we can better understand how the data will ladder up from, from a local department or a volunteer department inside of a, a county department inside of a larger region. Um, and then all of the, the big piece too is defining all of this essential information and making some commonality around it so that we can talk the same language. There's another question earlier in, in the chat around kind of dispatch CAD versus incident and, and how there's there's some inaccuracies potentially in CAD information. That's, you know, we 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 recognize that that incident types and sometimes locations might not be accurate, right? From from dispatch, because we're getting information from a person translated into a dispatch center and then back out to the fire service. And the reason why we want to capture both is because when it's accurate, we can confirm it's accurate and continue to move on without having to re-enter. If it's inaccurate, we can correct it in their incident schema, whether that's updating to a final incident type or improving the address location and saying this is where the actual incident was. Um, so, so having both of these things is, is really critical. Um, both of them will be configured with APIs so that we can connect um, between um, you know, directly feed into the system if if those those vendors are, are are partnered with us to connect, or you can enter them directly into our our data collection apps. And then the other piece, there was a question about how you know we we seem to be asking a lot more stuff. I mean, the 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 idea behind our schemas is to to ask the minimum set of, the minimum set of questions that we need to answer uh, to accurately describe an incident. So there are things that we've we've reduced so that we don't have to ask those questions. We can tap into property databases so we don't have firefighters asking for square footage and, and things like that. Um, we can tap into weather data, and I'll talk about some of this augmentation that we're going to do in, in a couple of slides from now, but that's kind of a, a big piece is if we can get it somewhere else, why are we going to ask the firefighter to enter it after an incident? The second phase of our schemas, which are currently um, fully in, in, in undergoing development, is around investigation or incident analysis. So that's where we can get into some of the more detailed uh, incident information that the line firefighter or the firefighter filling that out at two o'clock in the morning might not know. Um, you can complete it consecutively after the, the the core data schema, or you can complete it kind of asynchronous asynchronous if you dive into that incident uh, further down the line. But this gives us some detailed information about uh, things that we've historically just entered I don't know or unknown uh, in, in ENFERS, and that's really not a, a great practice for, for data accuracy. Uh, the same, the next piece is around personal exposure. While we're not gonna necessarily track all the individual exposure exposures inside of our system, what we wanna do is develop that schema such that we have a standardization around what personnel exposure really means um, so that we can start to have some commonality across the fire service. And the last piece is, is around community risk reduction. That's a big, big, a big part of, of you know, how do we reduce the burden for both medical and fire on the fire service? And that's around community risk reduction. So all of these things, and, and, and when you compound that with a changing climate, aging infrastructure, aging, aging population, there's a number of pieces of information that we can collect and leverage to help really kind of uh, improve our, our baseline expectations for, for the fire service. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit of more about our kind of uh, model here. And so this diagram is, is, a, is a pretty high level information or diagram of how the, the NARIS system is designed. Working from left to right, the left side is all of our data sources. So this is where we're going to ingest data, whether it's our native app, as Rebecca and Tom talked about, or our third party connections through existing CAD and RMSs. That's our pri <clears throat> primary pathway for data ingestion. Um, the other piece is because we have this organization spec or our entity spec, uh, we, we can start to tie in information about uh, stations and staffing and, and geopolitical boundaries as first dues and things, which allow us to have an ability to augment information. So you can already pull your existing stations when you're filling out an, or your, your existing units as you're filling out a report. Um, the other piece is augmentation. I talked a little bit about uh, weather, right? If we know if we can hit every incident in the country with weather and we start to identify train trends, whether there's a, a, a forecasted temperature change or any kind of historical data, we can start to link that and identify departments that, hey, if there's every time you've seen this kind of weather result, your call tick, your call volume has ticked up 15%. We can provide that insight back to the fire service. Things like social vulnerability so we can understand community risk around 
uh, where call volume is happening. We can hit parcel data to understand the value of the parcel. Uh, we can also start to augment it with some loss information coming from other sources. Uh, also, everything's going to be geocoded. So if, if we're geospatial at, at its first class, it allows us to link to all of these, these data sets. Uh, as we move through our ingestion into our data management, there's been some questions around, you know, uh, how do we handle data validation? So if, if a department is connected to their, their CAD or RMS, and if their RMS is already has validation rules, they're going to continue to follow those validation rules. Once they, they come into place, if they're already pre-validated, they'll be able to jump kind of basically into our um, you know, reconciled or augmented zone so we can start adding elements to that. If you're using our data collection app, you would dump directly into our landing zone. It would require validation within the NARA system to continue to move on. So this is where we can have that QA, QC. Uh, the other big piece is historically with Enfers, you know, people have developed Enfers apps around a PDF file, um, which is a flat 40 page file that basically tells them here's the elements we're collecting. Uh, part of our system here is also building out all the interconnectedness and all of the, the relationships between the variables. So if there's a, a skip logic built in place, that's going to come from the system itself so that the vendors can start to build towards a commonality versus them implying their logic to a particular set of schema. So that I think will also help a lot by having a lot of the logic flow built in first class as, as part of the system. And then the last piece is our data sharing and analytics. I think this is a big component of, of making sure that we're providing value. As, as Tom said, you know, giving something back to the fire service. There's going to be API feeds for departments and agencies to, to directly interact with the data. We're going to provide dashboards. As I think someone mentioned, is this going to be an ArcGIS uh, tool? There's going to be opportunities to have feature services and interact with, with data in, in ArcGIS and have dashboards. We'll also have feeds for dashboards built in, in other tools. So it's not just... Uh, meeting folks, you know, in an open source tool if they prefer it, but also meeting them where where they're currently operating. So if you're using AGOL in your current department infrastructure, we can share feature services so you can interact with your data that way. Uh, the other big piece is kind of a data marketplace. So if you don't have advanced uh, capabilities to extract all the data into your own environment and, and work in it, we're going to provide tools so that you can directly run queries against your data inside the environment so you don't have to do all the data transferring. So that's another big piece to, to be able to run your queries the way you need to for your department or your agency. Um, we're going to support that that big capability. If we go to the, the next slide, we can dive even further deeper into to a lot of this. Uh, one of the big pieces around our CAD dispatch uh, or CAD or dispatch schema is one around, you know, making sure that we are nine, NG911 compliant for our location information. And we're crosswalking against common geocoders, against a lot of the vendors to make sure if you aren't NG911, this is how it'll map into our system. Um, the other big piece is we know that dispatch codes are unique to a department. There's approximately, you know, any, any uh, department might have upwards of 200 dispatch codes. We don't want to remove them from, from the equation because that's how a department operates. And so the way we're, we're connecting to CADS is building a translation file. So we have dispatch, you know, or incident types coming through. Uh, we'll map those with the department as part of their onboarding to say, hey, these 200 dispatch codes map to these 60 and there's the, the really big advantage of that is one, it allows you to maintain access to your original uh, dispatch codes. They will stay in there as a standalone field. You'll still be able to operate on them, but by mapping in one level higher to a larger bin, now we can talk department to department. Um, when every department has their own set of 200 codes, it becomes very hard to actually have communication across departments. So this allows us to have a larger network to be able to, to strengthen some of that communication. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about how our incident scheme and where we've really made some changes. One of the biggest challenges historically with, with Enfer's incident data is that it's been a single incident type, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in our next slide, but that's a big change coming forward is allowing for multiple incident types. The other big piece is these, uh, a lot of this is more modular, so as you hit particular incident types, modules will turn on, they'll be dynamic. Uh, the other big piece is we're going to support, um, you know, casualties and rescues, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and then the last piece is around emergency, emerging hazards, which I'll also hit. So as we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll first talk about kind of how our, our incident types have changed. So when we think about uh, an Enfer's, you know, historical call, if you had a car crash with a fire that required extrication, is that a medical call because the, the occupant is injured? Is that a fire call because there was fire or is that a rescue call because there's extrication? Uh, now in, in, in NERIS, you can support all three. 
Um, and there's, you know, obviously some questions that might pop up of, well, how do we how do we deduplicate the fact that now we might have more incidents if we just count the individual incident types versus our total dispatches? That's a data analytics process that we're going to work through to solve the, the appropriate counting. But if on the on the converse side, how many calls did we miss that we were mischaracterized because we had to fit a call into one silo? So allowing this flexibility and freedom to really describe a call as it's happening, what you did provides us a lot more insight into the calls we're trying to respond to. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about our casualties and rescues. Uh, at the national level, we have not been tracking firefighter rescues and saves. Um, you know, at the national level, right? There's the firefighter rescue survey that has been built by firefighters. Um, and it's a really good product, but what we want to do is be able to incorporate this first class into, into Neris. So now we can independently track uh, rescues and also casualties. So whether they're firefighters or non-firefighters, that's our deviation point in the system because uh, we have different questions depending upon whether you were a firefighter or a non-firefighter, whether you were injured or, or rescued, um, and then injury types being fatal or non-fatal. So a lot of this now allows us to track all of this. The other big piece is, and, and a common question is, well, what happens if if there's a change right a firefighter or a civilian was injured and then now that became a, a fatal injury from a non-fatal injury over time you'll be able to update this both in your rms and push an updated version into into nearest or enter it into nearest and 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 the plan is eventually to be able to push back down to those rms's so all the records are are in sync but a big piece and a big shift is be able to track this right how many times do we see in the news where um we might see a, a single fatality as the headline but we don't track the fact that the firefighters also saved nine civilians. So the big piece is how do we start to bring this more, uh, you know, more forward facing in terms of our primary mission or one of our primary missions is, is the fire service is, is, is life safety. We can start to track a lot of this moving forward. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I can talk a little bit more about emerging hazards. You know, one of the challenges with, with the historical system our, our schema hasn't updated to reflect the, the hazards that we're currently facing in the fire service. So uh, one of the big modules here in, inside of NERIS is our emerging hazards. And this is something that's going to change over time. Uh, we had to seed it with something. We needed to start somewhere in our current emerging hazards around lithium ion batteries, photovoltaics, uh, CSST or corrugated stainless steel tubing. Um, these are the current pressing hazards, right? These are unknown hazards that require a little bit more information for us to, to really describe the fire problem. Uh, that the firefighters and, and first responders are facing. However, if these are not consistent problems and we find that, hey, we've, we've solved the CSST problem or lithium ion batteries aren't the hazard in 10 years that they are now, well, we don't need to continue to ask those questions. However, if we find that they are still a hazard, let's move them into a core module and become a core part of NERIS and allow something else to reseed it in, in our emerging hazards module. And so there's a handful of things. We're not necessarily limited to just fire hazards. If there's an emerging medical hazard, it can be also tracked in our emerging hazards module. And so part of it is, is, is one, to create a sensing function to look for anomalies in data, look for anomalies in CAD notes or, or narratives, but also build a pathway to allow users to also directly submit, hey, I think there's an emerging hazard. There's something different about this call. I don't know what, but they can provide direct uh, entry to us so that we can start to track and aggregate this and then create questions and a much faster frequency uh, to be able to track this information. Um, so as we as we think through all of these changes and, and kind of a holistic change to to this um, process, right? The next piece is, well, what does it mean from our timeline perspective? How do we get all of this done? And how do we get all this information out to to the fire service? So I'll, I'll tap back in for for Rebecca to kind of tap on or, or discuss a lot of that information as we move forward. Great, Craig, thank you so much. And I know you covered a lot of the questions that have been coming in through the chat, actually through your presentation. So I really hope folks have been listening into some of that, and we will take a few questions here at the end that I've identified. But before we do that, I want to give you an idea of the 12 month timeline um, that we have. So essentially, this timeline started back in May of uh, last year, really with the establishment of the partnership uh, between USFA, DHS, s and and FSRI. Uh, so that's an exciting uh, development for us. We're continuing community and stakeholder engagement through forums like this. I know I saw a lot of comments in the chat about asking, you know, who we're talking to when. I can tell you um, on any given week, we've got uh, nearest briefings and presentations out with different stakeholder groups. 
uh, multiple every week. Some of those are virtual in person, um, whether that's Tom or myself or Craig or, or David um, or Dr. Lori Moore Merrill. There's a number of us who are frequently on the ground and, and meeting with folks. So we are going to be continuing that. Additionally, we've just completed the development of the nearest prototype and onboarded six fire departments to do preliminary testing on that prototype. So that was just a few weeks ago, back in March. Um, and now we are at the point with the core nearest data schemas. Um, so that's the core that Craig presented on. That's the entity or organization specification. That's the CAD dispatch data uh, schema as well as the incident data schema that represents the core and so we'll be releasing the beta version of those in May of this year so next month and the intention there is that we are releasing those with ample time for whether CAD and RMS providers or others that want to really understand those data schemas maybe they want to write APIs to those schemas they're going to have those in a format that is, you know, authoritative and then for their developers that's easy for them to use. So those are coming in May. And then as we look to August of this year, uh, we will be launching the beta version of the nearest platform and onboarding a select 50 fire departments as early adopters. So that will be in August. And then as we look to November of this year, we'll be releasing nearest version one and launching phase one of onboarding. So there will be multiple phases of onboarding. There will also be updated versions and in, in what we call dot versions of nearest released uh, periodically. So a lot of good progress coming. Um, and then as we look out the next three years, I wanna give you a sense of what some of this means for the transition from NFERS to NEAREST. So I've already gone over what we're gonna accomplish in 2024. As we look to 2025, that's calendar year 2025, that will be a hybrid reporting year. And what I mean by that is some departments will report through nearest and others may still be on the legacy NFERS system. And that will be acceptable. And at USFA, we are coordinating with our grants uh, side of the house to make sure that grant guidance and the assistance to firefighters grants with regards to NFERS reporting will get updated in the next cycle to reflect both nearest and NFERS. And then as we look to calendar year 2026, so effective January 1st, 2026, all fire-based incident reporting will occur through nearest. So there will be no more record reporting starting in calendar year 2026 into NFERS. So that's really the big kind of transition point and we'll also be decommissioning the legacy NFERS system as well. Um, so that's the trajectory we're on. We have time, we're working through this, and that's why we're having engagements like today. So uh, next slide. So just as a refresh for you all, for those of you with who are with fire departments or support fire departments, I see you in here. Um, this is just a refresh to remind you about what to do to prepare for onboarding onto NEARES. Uh, so as Tom, uh, I'll just reiterate, we want to, you know, identify who from your fire department will be the lead for nearest onboarding, understand and know who your CAD and RMS vendors are if you have them, and start talking with them about nearest integration. And then determine uh, your fire department boundaries. So I already answered some questions in the chat about uh, getting your GIS staff engaged to know what you're gonna need to be able to provide into NEARES on some basic information. Um, and then start to gather some key information about your fire department, your stations, their locations, the services and staffing at each of those stations. Um, it's mostly the same data. If you participated in USFA's fire department registry or fire department census, it's much of that data. We'll want to make sure that it's updated as you uh, create your profiles and nodes inside of NEARES. So just some tips and tricks to get ready for uh, NEARES. Next slide. So what we have here are a couple of links to some web pages with NEARES information. So there's general information. We will be doing a national nearest webinar on May 2nd of this year. So that's just in about less than a month from now that will be focused on 
the release of the beta version of those nearest core data schemas, as well as initial feedback some fr from some of the fire departments participating in the prototype testing of the nearest platform. And then we have some updated frequently asked questions. I know a lot of the questions you've asked in the chat are actually covered in our FAQs up on our website. And then as you have any additional questions leading into the launch of Nearest, please feel free to reach out to the Nearest Information Desk at nearest at ul.org. So those are the major items that we have today. I know we have about four minutes left, and I did want to take an opportunity and go around the phone to our other uh, presenters here today. And I'll start with David. If there's any any closing comments you may have. Uh, no closing comments, just important that the community recognizes this is an opportunity for all of us to advance together. So I encourage uh, you to seek uh, additional information and uh, also ask us if you need help. We're here to help as we onboard and move the community forward. Thank you, David. And over to Craig, any closing thoughts from your end? Uh, no, I think this could. Uh, I appreciate all the the questions and interest. We're trying our best to answer them as they come through. Um, and uh, I think the one piece we we didn't highlight when we had the schemas out for for public uh, and national engagement, we had sixteen hundred comments that we addressed. So uh, we 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 have been listening, and uh, we're excited that there's been so much interest and feedback, and we're excited to continue to move this forward. Thank you, Craig. And uh, any last words from Tom Jenkins? No, thank you, Rebecca. I, I did want to mention that uh, included in the chat is a link to be an early adopter. So if there are um, fire department agencies represented today that are interested in being part of the early onboarding process, we'd love to have a conversation and uh, certainly appreciate everybody's questions and attention today. Reach out anytime. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Peter to get us Thanks. closed up. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, and and thanks to the the total nearest team. This is terrific. Um, uh, really impressed with the progress everyone's making, and this is an exciting time. Um, and just reiterate David and and Tom's points that um, get engaged, ask questions, um, because this is a change, but it's a really exciting change. Um, with that, I'm just going to move quickly um, in the interest of time to wrap up and just let everyone know um, NAPSIG does have three more prep tech talks scheduled for this year. Um, I'm excited about them, but I got to say we've set a really high bar today, so I'm, I'm excited to see how we uh, we reach that bar. But in June, August and November, um, we have these um, sessions coming up. And um, as always, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you have any questions about this particular prep tech talk, or if you have anything that NAPSIG can do for you um, going forward, um, we're here to help the community. So please let me know um, and reach out to me directly for anything that I might be able to do to help you all. Um, again, big thank you for you, uh, the participants, for spending an hour with us. And a really big thank you to the nearest team for everything you guys are doing. Um, exciting time for the community. And with that, we'll officially end these, this prep tech talk and thank everyone for participating.